A Tale of Magic, Chapter 9, Madame Weatherbury's Academy of Magic. After leaving the mine, Emeralda tried her best to remain as unimpressed by Madame Weatherbury's magic as possible. When the fairy transformed four field mice into unicorns, Emerald's eyes grew very large, but she didn't make a sound. When Madame Weatherbury removed the brooch from her gown and turned it into a golden carriage, Emerald's breathing increased, but she didn't say a word. However, as the as the uni- unicorns transported them, them across the southern kingdom, at extraordinary speed, Emeralda was having a difficult time concealing her amazement. Isn't this spectacular, Sanctus said. If you whip your head around really fast like this, you can catch a glimpse of the land. The boy gave Emeralda an example, and she almost tried it herself, but then she remembered to keep her appearance unenthusiastic. We're still giggled at Emeralda's failing facade. You know, it's okay to be a little excited, Bristol said. No matter what you see or we see or do, nothing will ever make the mine any less special to you. Emeralda pursed her lips to suppress a smile, but it surfaced anyways. All right, I admit this is pretty amazing, she said. For fun, the dwarfs and I used to race runaway carts through the mine, but they never went as fast as this. How are the unicorns doing it? They're compelled by magic, Madame Weatherberry explained. Not only are unicorns the fastest animals on the planet, but they also always know their passenger's exact destination and the quickest route to get there. Are we close to the academy? Emeralda asked. I'll take a couple of hours. It'll take a couple of hours to reach the southern kingdom's eastern border, then it's just a short distance through the east in between. Madame Weatherbury said, we should arrive just before sunset. We aren't getting out of the carriage again, are we? Sanctus asked. Unfortunately not, Madame Weatherbury said. As much as I would love to teach you another lesson at the expense of a hostile creature, there's a special path in the forest the unicorns know to take. Madame Weatherbury, I keep forgetting to ask, but what is the academy? Bristol inquired. Is it a house, a cabin, a cave? Madame Weatherbury smiled playfully as she thought about her academy. You'll see, the fairy said. Some things in life are better seen than described. A couple of hours later, the golden carriage approached the eastern border of the southern kingdom. Just like the western border, the thick forest of the in-between grew along the eastern border like a gigantic twisted fence the trees were so close together there was barely room for a person to walk between them but the unicorns charged ahead they fought they found an opening bristol would never have spotted on her own and the steeds pulled the golden carriage into a narrow road as they traveled through the end bench In between, the unicorns slowed down to guide the carriage safely down to the winding path. Bristol was unsettled by the eerie sights of the dark forest outside her window. She expected a ferocious animal or monstrous creature to jump out from the darkness and attack their carriage at any moment. Bristol figured Xanthus and Emeralda were feeling the same way because both their companions had covered their eyes and sunk in both her companions had covered their eyes and sunk in their seats. Unsurprisingly, Madame Weatherbury wasn't affected by their frightening surroundings at all. The fairy kept a confident and watchful eye on the trees passing by, like she was pre- prepared for whoever or whatever might cross their path. Time seemed to move much slower in the in-between than it had in the southern kingdom, but eventually the golden carriage came to an abrupt stop. Bristol, Emeralda, and Xanthus looked out the window and saw that the unicorns had stopped because the road was blocked by a massive hedge wall. 
The strange plant was taller than the trees and stretched for miles in both directions. The leaves and branches were so thick the hedge was practically solid. We're here, Madame Weatherberry said cheerfully. We're here, Madame Weatherberry said cheerfully. Her students had no idea what the fairy was talking about. The longer the unicorn stayed put at the dead end, the more they felt like sitting ducks in the dangerous forest. Suddenly, the hedge started to shake and snap. The leaves and branches slowly parted to form an arch that that was wide enough for the carriage to fit through. The unicorns moved under the arch and entered a long leafy tunnel cut through the thick edge. Hedge. The passageway went on for several hundred feet, and the children were amazed by were amazed by how dense the hedge was. It was so dark in the tunnel, Bristol couldn't see her hands in front of her face. Madam Weatherberry, what is this? Bristol asked. Just a little barrier I planted around the property to protect the academy. Madam Weatherberry said. A little barrier? Sanctus asked. The shrub is enormous. It may seem like overgrown shrubbery, but the hedge is actually equipped with a very powerful spell, Madame Weatherberry said. It only opens for people and animals with magic in their blood. It'll keep us safe from all the restless creatures wandering in, in between. The unicorns reached the end of the tunnel and stopped at another leafy wall. Beams of bright light shone into the dark tunnel as a second arch opened and granted the carriage access to Madame Weatherberry's property. The unicorns excited, exited the hedge barrier, and their young passengers realized they weren't in the creepy woods anymore. The golden carriage proceeded down the path into a rolling field of the most vibrant wild flowers the children had ever seen. The land was sprinkled with trees that were covered in ca colorful maple leaves, blushing cherry blossoms, and bloom blooming magnolias. A crystal clear, clear lake was lined with weeping willows, and it spilled into streams and ponds with vivid water lilies. The, the picture estate stretched toward a cliff overlooking a sparkling blue ocean where the sun was setting in a horizon of rosy clouds. I don't believe it, Bristol said. It's like we're inside a painting. I've never seen so much color in my whole life, Emerald exclaimed. We must be dead, Cynthia said. Our carriage crashed in the forest and now we're in paradise. It's the only explanation. Madame Weatherberry was incredibly touched by the excitement in, their stu in her students' face, faces. I've waited a long time to see smiles like those, she said. Many years of hard work have been put into developing this place. I hope it becomes as much your home as it is mine. The carriage continued down the path, and there were more surprises at every turn. Bristol was mesmerized when she saw there were herds of unicorns gazing and frolicking through the fields around them. She looked up and noticed the sky was filled with huge colorful butterflies and enormous birds with long auburn feathers. Look at all the unicorns in the fields, she said, and up there, have you seen such big birds and butterflies before? I've seen some pretty nasty bugs and bats in the mine, but nothing like those, Emeralda said. Madame Weatherberry chuckled. Actually, those aren't butterflies or birds, she said. You might want to take a closer look. Bristol, Emeralda, and Xanthus pressed their faces against the window for a better view. After a, after a long inspection, the children realized the butterflies had tiny human-like bodies that wore clothing made from leaves and flower petals. The tiny creatures flew in and out of miniature mushroom homes along the path. The birds in question had heads and wings like eagles, front claws like reptiles, and hind legs and tails like lions. They soared through the sky like hawks and brought squirrels, mice, fish, and other prey to the hungry hatchlings waiting in their nests. What the heck are those things? Sanctus asked. They're pixies and griffins, Madame Weatherberry said. 
and they're both easily offended. So make sure you never call them bugs or birds to their faces. So they still exist, Bristol asked. In The Truth About Magic, you wrote that humankind had hunted all the magical animals into extinction. And they nearly did, Madame Weatherberry said. Fortunately, I was able to find survivors and save a few species before they were lost forever. I, it was safer to let humanity go on believing they had all been annihilated. Sadly, I wasn't able to rescue all the magical animals that used to roam the earth. This property is as much sanctuary for the pix pixies, the Gryffindors, and the unicorns as it is for us. Emeralda gasped and pointed at the, win at the window. Is that what I think it is, she asked. Bristol and Xanthus looked in the direction Emeralda was referring to and had the same reaction. In the distance, perched on the edge of a cliff overlooking the ocean, was a golden castle. The castle had tall pointed towers and hundreds of wide windows, and the entire structure sparkled in the sunlight. The carriage continued on the path through the property and stopped at the castle's front steps. Madame Weatherberry escorted the children outside and gestured excitedly to the castle before them. Welcome to Madame Weatherberry's Academy of Magic, the fairy said. What do you think of the new name? I decided less was, was more. Bristol sank this, and Emeralda didn't respond because they were completely overwhelmed by the dazzling structure in front of them. Madame Weatherberry was right. S some things in life were better seen than described. Even after all the incredible books she had read in the library, Bristol doubted words could ever explain the castle's magnificent appearance or the exhilarating feeling it gave her. The it was difficult to believe something so beautiful existed in the world, but the castle never faded from her view. Madame Weatherberry clapped her hands, and the unicorns were released from their reins. The steeds galloped into the nearby field and joined their grazing herd. She snapped her fingers to shrink the golden carriage to her brooch again and pinned it to her gown. The castle's giant front doors opened and two little girls and an old woman came outside to greet the new arrivals. The first little girl was about 10 years old and wore a dress made from dripping patches of honeycomb. Her bright orange hair was styled into a beehive and was home to a live swarm of bumblebees. The second little girl also looked 10 years old and she wore a navy robe over a sapphire bathing suit. Instead of hair, a continuous stream of water flowed down her body and evaporated as it reached her feet, like she was a walking waterfall. The old woman was dressed much more simply simply than the girls and wore a plum dress with a matching apron. She had grayish violet hair and a messy bun, and other than the unusual hair color, her appearance wasn't as magical as the others. Children, I'd like you to meet Miss Tangerina Turkin, Miss Skyline Lavenders, and the Academy's housekeeper, Mrs. V. Madam Weatherberry said. Girls, these are our new students, Bristol Evergreen, Emerald Stone, and Xanthus Hayfield. Mrs. V was ecstatic to see the newcomers. She hurried down the front steps and gave each of them a hug, bear hug, a huge bear hug, rocking them back and forth. I don't mean to invade your personal space, but I'm just so happy I could burst, Mrs. V said with tearful eyes. Madame Weatherberry has been dreaming of opening an academy for so long, and the day is finally here. I hope you've all brought an appetite, because I'm cooking up a feast in the kitchen. Does anyone have any allergies or diet dietary restrictions I should know about? Bristol, Emeralda, and Xanthus all shrugged and shook their heads. Well, that's a big relief, Mrs. V said. Tonight, I'm serving one of my specialties, Griffin Pot Pie. Ha ha ha, I'm just kidding. Oh, you should have seen the looks on your faces. I would have never 
I would never cook something like that. Besides, griffins are way too fat, fast to catch. Ha <laughs> ha! Got you again. But in all seriousness, I couldn't be more thrilled to have you. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'd better get back to the kitchen before dinner grows legs and runs away. Ha <laughs> ha! Actually, that one is based on a true story. I'll see you inside. Mrs. V hurried back up the front set steps and dashed into the castle. Bristol, Xanthus, and Emeralda were slightly terrified after meeting the animated housekeeper and looked to Madame Weatherberry for reassurance. Don't worry, Miss. Don't worry. Mrs. V's cooking isn't much better than her comedy. Is much better than her comedy, she said. Although the housekeeper seemed eccentric and goofy, Bristol, Xanthus, and Emeralda appreciated her attempt to welcome them. Welcome them to the academy. Tangerina and Skyline, however, stayed on the castle's front steps and eyed the newcomers like they were competition of some kind. Bristol sensed the tension and tried to break the ice. I love what both of you are wearing, she said. Are you students too? Tangerina and Skyline both grunted, insulted by Bristol's comment. We're apprentices, but Tangerina said in a condescending tone. What's the difference? Bristol asked. We apprentice things, Skyline said, like it was obvious. Bristol, Zanthus, and Emeralda looked to one another to see if Skyline made sense to anyone else, but no one knew what the girl was talking about. Tangerina was embarrassed by her friend's remark and quickly pulled her aside. Aside, Skyline, I told you to let me do all the talking when the newbies showed up. She whispered. Oh, I thought you said you. I thought you said new bees. Skyline whispered back. I thought you were finally doing something different with your hair. You never listen, Tangerina said. You've got too much water in your ears. Skyline tilted her head to the left and the right, and sure enough, over a gallon of water pulled out from both ears. Tangerina rolled her eyes at her friend and turned back to the newcomers. As I was saying, apprentices. Are much more advanced than students," she, expl she explained. "We're going to assist Madame Weatherberry as she teaches the three of you to use your magic. And now that you're here, I can see she's going to need all the help she can get. Tangerina, be nice to the new students," Madame Weatherberry said. "We'll all be here learning and growing together, no matter how advanced some of us might be." But we can discuss all of that during our first lesson tomorrow. In the meantime, let's give our recruits a tour of the castle while Mrs. V finishes preparing dinner. The fairy escorted her students and apprentices up the front steps and through the castle's front doors. Bristol's mouth dropped open at her first glimpse of the castle's interior because it was just as breathtaking as the exterior. The entrance. Hall had shimmering white walls, sparkling silver floors, and golden pillars that stretched into a towering ceiling above them. In the center of the hall was a gigantic tree that grew crystal leaves and blossoms. An, ele an elegant staircase curled around the tree, and the steps floated in mid-air as the stairs spiraled toward toward the upper levels of the castle. This castle is one of the last mag magical residents left," Madame Weatherberry said. The majority of them were destroyed when King Champion the First declared that magic was a crime. I inherited the estate from my family, and I've kept it hidden and protected ever since. It's very important that none of you leave the property without me. As you know, the in. Between is full of people and creatures who would like to harm us. Something about Madame Weatherberry's warning didn't sit well with Bristol. Madame Weatherberry, she asked, "I thought your family was human." The fairy was magic was pleasantly surprised by Bristol's attention to detail. Oh, I forgot to mention that, Madame Weatherberry said. While my birth family were human, I was referring to the fairies who adopted me and taught me to. To develop my, my magic, 
you see the magical community is lucky because we get to create new families if our relatives forsake us. The six of us may not be related to by blood, but with time, I hope we'll regard each other as a chosen family. Since they all had all just met, it was hard for Bristol to picture becoming that close with the other students. Still, it was nice to imagine someone could fill the void created by living, leaving her mother and brothers behind. Now, if you'll follow me, I'll show you to the sitting room, Madam Weatherbury said. The fairy led them down a corridor to the right of the entrance hall, and they entered a spacious room with silk sofas and tough and tough lounge chairs. The walls were covered in floral wallpaper and decorated with the heads of ho horned animals. Once they stepped inside the sitting room, the flowers and vines in the wallpaper became three dimensional and three dimensional and a flowery aroma filled the air the deer and elk heads mounted on the walls also came to life and snacked on the plants growing around them be careful around the decorative heads they like to bite madam weatherberry warned moving on the dining room is just around the corner down the hall from the sitting room was another large room with a table made from a wide, flat rock. The dining room was illuminated by a cluster of glowing moonstones that hovered over the table like a chandelier. The walls were dark and decorated with twinkling lights, so the room looked like a starry night sky. As Bristol examined the lights, she screamed with a shoot at when a shooting star suddenly shot across the ceiling. Breakfast is served every morning at 7 o'clock sharp. Lunch starts at noon, and dinner begins at 6. Beyond time for meals, Mrs. V is a perfectionist when it comes to her food, and she hates serving her dishes cold. The kitchen is through the swinging door at the end of the dining room, and Mrs. V's chambers are just beyond that. Well, that's everything on the first floor. Now, if you please follow me back to the entrance hall, I'll show you my office on the second floor. But, Madam Weatherberry, Sanctus asked, you said this was a school, so where are all the classrooms? There aren't any classrooms in the castle, the fairy said. I'll be teaching the majority of my lessons outside on the academy grounds. I've always thought fresh ideas are easier to retain, to retain with fresh air. The tour returned to the entrance hall, and they carefully climbed a f the floating staircase to the second level of the castle. Madame Weatherberry's office uh, was through a pair of wooden doors. Just like the cover of The Truth About Magic, they were engraved with the images of a unicorn and a griffin. The office was a circular chamber, chamber with, incredibly, with incredible views of the ocean and the academy property. All of the furniture was made of glass, so, including a bulky desk that sat at the end of the room. The chamber was lined with shelves of spell books and cabinets of potions and el elixirs. The high ceiling was filled with white fluffy clouds that changed that changed into the shapes of different animals as they bobbed up and down. Instead of fire, a stream of bubbles emitted from a grand fireplace and floated through the air. The entire wall above the fireplace was covered in a massive replica of the map of magic. To the students' amusement, a rack of elaborate fascinators was placed by Madame Weatherberry's desk. And the fairy owned a hat in every color. If you ever need something, please don't hesitate to find me in here, Madam Weatherberry said. However, on the rare occasion I'm called away from the academy, my office is off limits to students. Well, if there's any if there aren't any questions, I'll show you to your bedrooms on the third floor. We'll have our own rooms, Synthus asked. Oh, yes, Madame Weatherbury said. The castle has seven bedrooms and counting. What do you mean, and counting? 
Emeralda asked. It's one of the many per perks of living in a magical residence, Madam Weatherberry explained. The castle grows extra bedrooms based on the number of residents. And it usually designs the chambers around the occu occupants. Occupants' specific, specific needs. There were only bedrooms for for Tangerina and Skylene on the third floor when I left the castle to recruit you, but there should be one for each of you now. Shall we take a look? The students eagerly followed Madame Weatherberry up the stairs to a long corridor on the third floor. Just as she predicted, the corridor had five doors, and the ladder th and the latter three looked much newer than the first two, like the corridor had recently been renovated. As they passed, as they passed the first door, the students peered inside Tangerina's bedroom and instantly understood what Madame Weatherberry meant about the rooms being designed for the residents' needs. All of the walls and furniture in Tangerina's bedroom were made of honeycomb, and everything was drenched by honey. Just like her hair, the chamber was the home of a thousand buzzing bumblebees, and the floor was covered with live, live daisies to provide the swarm with nectar. The groom across the t corridor from Tangerina's bedroom belonged to Skylene. The chamber had no floor and instead dropped straight into an indoor pool. Every inch of the room was tiled with blue porcelain and the only, and the only piece of furniture was a gondola bed floating on the pool's surface. Uh, the third, the third room in the corridor had a heavy steel door, and Madame Weatherberry, and Madame Weatherberry, grunted as she heaved it open. Saying this, I'm assuming this one belongs to you," she said. Inside, the entire room was made out of the same industrial steel as the door. There were no windows in the chamber, and absolutely nothing was flammable, even. Even Zanxis's metal bed had foil sheets. Instead of carpet or tile, the floor was finished with metal grates, and instead of a ceiling, a brick chimney was built over the room. It's like a giant oven, Zanxis said enthusiastically. Even if I took off my metal, I wouldn't hurt anyone in here. It's the perfect place to blow off some steam, Madam Weatherberry said. Now, Emeralda, I believe your room is next. Behind the fourth door in the corridor was a dark room with dirt walls. There was a four poster there was a four poster bed made from stalagmites, a wardrobe constructed out of a mine cart, and a workbench that held stacks of coal. Emerald stepped inside her room and had a dizzying moment of deja vu. It's just like my cave at the mine, she said. It even smells like dwarfs in here. Hopefully it'll keep you from getting too homesick, Madam Weatherberry said. Last but not least, we have Bristol's room. The fifth and final door in the corridor led to the base of a tower. There was a bed identical to the bed she had had in the evergreen house and a big comfy armchair exactly like the one she enjoyed at the Chariot Hills Library. But most amazing of all, the walls were covered with shelves of books from the floor to the ceiling. A display case in the corner of the room held over two dozen pairs of reading glasses. And like Madame Weatherberry's collection of fascinators, there was a pair in every color. Bristol looked around her new bedroom, her eyes filled with happy tears and her heart fluttering in her chest. She scanned the, ti she scanned the tile titles on the shelves and caress car the book's spines like she was saying hello to long lost friends. The Tales of Tidbit Twitch, volumes 2 through 10. She was shocked to find them. I didn't even know there, there was one sequel, let alone nine. Oh, and look at this, Madam Weatherberry said and pointed to another book on one of the shelves. You even have a copy. 
a copy of The Truth About Magic. Perhaps you'll be inspired to finish it one of these days. No pressure, of course. Well, children, children, that completes our tour of the castle. You're more than welcome to inspect the other rooms and towers, but I'm afraid you'll only find a century's worth of storage and cobwebs. Suddenly, a, ch a chime rang through the castle to announce the start of dinner. Unlike the gong at the Bootstrap Correctional Facility, the chimes were pleasant and inviting, like they were announcing the start of a grand performance. Sounds like Mrs. V is finally ready for us, Madam Weatherbury said. Let's not keep her waiting. The students followed Madame Weatherbury down the corridor, but were still stayed in her room for a few moments before, before joining them. Of all the astonishing things she had seen today, nothing was more beautiful than the sight of her very own library. At dinner, the students were served a three-course meal of tomato soup grilled chicken with roasted carrots and blueberry pie. Other than the colorful berries and, mu and muffins Bristol ate in the golden carriage, it was the most delicious food she had ever tasted. She couldn't believe she would be treated to three meals like this every day. It was quite a contrast to the food at the Bootstrap Correctional Facility. Over in the meal, Madam Weatherberry told the new students stories about the obstacles she faced while, she, while starting her, their academy. She recalled how she met with the so sovereigns of all four kingdoms, and despite her persuasive request, was only granted permission by King Champion the VI the six, to recruit students in the southern kingdom, Bristol, in the southern kingdom. Bristol, Xanthus, and Emeralda were on the edge of their seats as they listened to, the, to her exciting tales. May I have some more water, Xanthus asked, after stuffing his face with a third helping of blueberry pie. I can help you with that, Skyline said. She leaned over the table and stuck her hand in the boy's glass. A stream of water poured out of her indexed finger and filled his glass to the brim. Bristol and Emeralda were impressed by Skyline's trick, but Sanctus thought it was, but Sanctus was disturbed by the liquid coming out of her body. Is there any other water? He asked. Of all of all seven people around the table, Tangerina seemed to be enjoying herself the least. She grunted at everything the newcomers said and rolled her eyes at every question they asked. She found their curiosity about magic to be incredibly irritating, like they should have been more prepared for before arriving. So what do you do so what do you do? she asked. Sorry, Bristol said. Well, I know you're all here because you can do magic, but what are you special at your specialties? Tangerina asked. What's a specialty? Bristol asked. Tangerine and Skyling were, were shocked by her ignorance. A specialty is your strongest magical talent, Tangerine explained. It's usually the trait that reveals your magic and separates you from the rest of the world. Bees are my specialty. Water is Skyline's. And based on his room upstairs, I'm guessing that Xanthus' spe specialty has something to do with fire. Ooh, that's why his room was made of metal, Skyline said. I was hoping it has something to do with barbecue. How disappointed. How disappointing. Tangerina ignored her friend. As I was saying, she went on, saying this was easy to figure out, but I'm still not sure about you two. Emeralda was a little annoyed by Tangerina's need to categorize them. She closed her eyes, placed an open palm on the stone table, and transformed the whole thing into a giant emerald. That's what I do, she said blankly. Despite their best attempts to conceal it, Tangerina and Skyline were awestruck by Emeralda's demonstration. What about you, Bristol? Skyline asked. What's your specialty? 
Oh, I'm not sure if I have one of those, she said. I've never done magic without the help of, help of a spell. All fairies have specialties, Tangerina said, and crossed her arms, unless your specialty is that you're not special at all. Tangerina, please keep your stinger to yourself, Madame Weatherberry reprimanded. So far, Bristol has shown a talent for manif manif manifestation, and she had one of the brightest stars on my map, map of magic. Just because her specialty hasn't revealed itself yet doesn't mean it won't do so very soon. Madame Weatherberry gave Bristol an encouraging wink, but it didn't make Tangerina's comments any less hurtful. Without an obvious specialty, Bristol felt inferior to to the other student students and she started wondering if she even belonged at the academy the embarrassment made her blush and she counted down the seconds until dinner was over well i know one thing for sure mrs v said my specialty has always been food and if anyone disagrees after that meal they can go catch a griffin ha <laughs> ha after dinner madam weatherberry it excuse the students from the table, and they went to their rooms to get ready for bed. Bristol was still feeling crummy from Tangerina's remarks, but fortunately she knew the perfect remedy to take her mind off it. She selected The Tales of Tidbit Twitch, Volume 2, from her shelf, chose a fresh pair of reading glasses, and, cr and crawled into her soft bed. While Bristol read the sequel to her favorite book, an abrupt storm blew in from the ocean and soaked the academy grounds. Bristol was startled by the booming thunder and the flashes of lightning outside her window. But she wasn't going to let the weather disturb her first night at the castle. Her floor mates, however, weren't so brave. A few minutes into the storm, there was a soft knock at Bristol's door. Come in, she called. The door, the door swung open and Emerilda peeked inside with large, fearful eyes. Sorry to bother you, Bristol, Emerilda said. Is everything all right with your room, Bristol asked. No, everything is fine, she said. I'm just not used to thunder. That's one of the best parts about living in in an underground mine. You don't have to worry about the weather. If you wouldn't mind, I was wondering, well, I was wondering... You're more than welcome to sleep here if the thunder is scaring you, Bristol said. Emerald sighed with relief. Gee, thanks. What are you reading? The Tales of Tidbit Twitch, Volume 2, Bristol said. It's the sequel to my favorite book of all time. Have you ever heard of it? Emerald thought about it and shook her head. Papa used to read me stories before bed, but I don't remember that one. Would you sleep better if I read the first one to you? Bristol asked. Really? Emerald said. Are you sure you wouldn't mind? Not at all, she said. It's on the shelf to your left. Emerald retrieved the tales of Tidbit Twitch and joined Bristol in bed. Bristol opened the book to the very first page, but before she started reading, both girls jumped at the growling thunder outside. It was followed by the sound of feet frantically running down the corridor. Xanthus appeared in the doorway, just as startled by the weather as Emerald had been. Hi, girls, Xanthus peeped. Crazy storm, huh? It's wild, Bristol said. How are you holding up? Me? Oh, I'm doing great, Xanthus said, but his panicked face told otherwise. I just came to check on you two. We're fine, Bristol said. Actually, I'm Elda and I were just about to start a book. If you're interested in hearing a story. Another crack of thunder influenced Sanctus' decision, and he leaped into the bed with the girls. Bristol and Emerilda were tickled by his reaction, and they, and they made room. Bristol cleared her throat in preparation for reading aloud, but just as she started the first sentence, Tangerita and Skywayne burst into her room and shut the door behind them, as if the terrible sp storm was, had been chasing them. Hello, ladies, Bristol said. What seems to be the problem? Tangerina and Skyline were too embarrassed to admit they were scared. They looked to each other, hoping the other would come up with a good excuse. Um, I wet the bed, Skyline said. Tangerina rolled her eyes. 
Skyline, your bed is always wet, she whispered. Oh, yeah, she mumbled back. We just heard noises coming from your room and wanted to make sure that the three of you weren't causing any trouble, Tangerine said. Well, as you can see, we're very well behaved, Bristol said. We're just about to read a book to calm our nerves. Good. I'm glad you're not up to any mischief, Tangerina said. Now that we've seen your acting appropriately, we'll head back to our rooms. Although she said they were leaving, neither Tangerina nor Skyline moved a muscle. You know, just because... Apprentices are more advanced than students. Doesn't mean they enjoy stories any less, Bristol said. You're both welcome to stay with us if the storm is making you uneasy. Before Tangerina or Skyline could respond, the thunder roared louder than before. The girl shrieked and dived into the bed with the others. I I suppose... We could stick around for a few minutes, Tangerina said. What are you reading? The Tales of Tidbit Twitch by Tom Free Taylor, Bristol said. What's it about? Skyline asked. Emeralda grunted and eyed the others threateningly. If everyone would just shut up and stop interrupting her, we might find out, she scolded. All the classmates classmates went quiet so bristol could start the book once upon a time there was a kingdom of mice she read and all of the mice in the kingdom none was braver than a young a young mouse named tidbit twitch bristol read the book for hours and she was delighted by what by what a captivated audience her floor mates were Eventually, all the students and apprentices began to fall asleep, and she marked their last page so they could continue the story later. They all slept in a pile on Bristol's bed while they waited for the weather to die down. It was only their first night at the castle, but thanks to a thunderstorm and a good story, the children at Madame Weatherbury's Academy of Magic were already acting like the chosen family their instructor hoped they'd become.